Welcome to FEM TV. I'm your host, Farhana Kassam. I'm joined today for a special segment on women in medicine. My two guests today are none other than Dr. Deb Banerjee and Dr. Gunjan Goel. Ladies, thank you for joining us. Thank you for, thank having-, you for having us. Well, you both are fascinating to me. You're both dentists during a time of pandemic. We're going to have to delve into so much of that. But you know what I'd love to start with a little bit is background. Tell us a little bit about your journey to get to where you currently are professionally. Gunjan, let's start with you. Okay. Um, I don't want to go too far back, but I was born in India and I got to Toronto by the way of Zambia, Tanzania, and then went to university in Toronto. Uh, for four years, and then dental school uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. So that was my first time in the U.S. Did my dental education there, worked in the U.S. for five years, moved back to Toronto where my family is, and that's when I started working with Dr. Banerjee, and I've been practicing in Toronto since. So that's about 10 years in Toronto now. Wow, so you two know each other personally as well. This is great. This is going to make for an even better story. Deb, tell us a little bit about how you came to be in uh, the dental profession. Why, why this? Um, again, uh, my background, I was born and raised in England, in London. Uh, dad was at sea. He was chief engineer of a shipping line based out of London and uh, Africa. We traveled a lot. It was hard on my mom. Um, So we ended up moving to Canada. Um, Huge culture shock. (laughs) Uh, I was used to a lot of multicultural uh, people, Indian, English, uh, you name it, in England, India. And then we moved to small town Kitchener, Waterloo. (laughs) I thought we were the only brown family for a long time. And I had a, at least back then, a limey accent. Um, so it, it was, it was a, a bit of a shock, bit of an adjust, adjustment. Um, I ended up going to Waterloo, Waterloo University, and then got into U of T, U of T dentistry. Um, my path had always been medicine, but uh, I ended up meeting a, a mentor. He was my dentist, Dr. Chong. And he, uh, he looked like he was having so much fun doing dentistry. <laughs> he totally uh, sidewinked me. And um, yeah, I, I changed my focus from medicine to dentistry. Uh, went to U of T Dentistry. And uh, I've been practicing downtown Toronto, uh, oh my gosh, for 25, 26 years. Wow. Yeah. Well. This is an impressive story. Now, you both, being women of color, being women in the medical profession, can you uh, maybe share some stories with us, if you have any, of challenges that you may have had to overcome because of gender, because of your profession, maybe even because of your ethnicity and your background, being a visible minority. I mean, those are some challenges I think a lot of us still feel like we're coming up against in various industries. The medical profession, maybe 20, 25 years ago, will be a little more so than today, but it would be really interesting to hear something about your challenges and how you chose to overcome them being females of color. Deb, let's Um, start with you. Oh, with me. Um, You know what? you know, Gigi and I, Dr. Goyle <laughs> and I, we were, we were chatting about this and, um, you know, my background growing up in England, growing up in India, and then coming to Canada, um, maybe a, a little bit of racism when I was growing up in, in Kitchener, but going into university, Waterloo, and definitely coming to U of T, um, at least in 19, I'm going to age myself a bit, 1990, 1990 to 94, there was a definite mandate at U of T to uh, have more females, more women uh, in medicine, in dentistry. And my class, 
as I was telling Dr. Goyle, uh, we were almost 50-50. I looked at my class list, my, my picture actually, and uh, it was 50, 56% uh, men and 44% women. So it was almost even, which is amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. And going to school in the States, uh, Dr. Goal, how, how did you find it? Was it similar? Was it different? Dental school in particular? So what's interesting is, as um, I mentioned, we spoke about this and my experience was very different. So I started dental school in 2000. And like I said, I went to Case Western in Cleveland, you know, Midwestern, um, Ohio. And it was the first time in my life that I actually started to self-identify as a visible minority. Because up until that point, I had lived in India where everyone looked like me, or I had gone to international schools in the two countries I lived in, in Eastern Africa. When I came to U of T, again, very diverse, tons of South Asians, all, all nationalities. So now for the first time in my life, I moved to Cleveland, Ohio by myself, starting dental school. I go to first day of school class and we had 70 students of which 50 were men. And there were only four people in my class that were visible minorities. So not only was there a huge discrepancy in the number of male to female, but they were primarily white men. It wasn't just confined to you know, the students in my class. It was also all our teachers, the professors, white men. There was no one that looked like me. I distinctly remember the only professor I had that was a brown female was my statistics professor. And um, it was, it was, it was extraordinary to me that I was being taught this profession entirely by white men. And to this day, I don't really have any kind of relationship really with my alma mater because I never really truly felt a sense of belonging there or an understanding. I mean, they gave me a great education, but I definitely felt for the first time in my life that I was somewhere where I didn't belong. And since then, um, you know, I had other incidences occur there. Like, I don't know if you can tell on the video, but I have my nose pierced and I got hauled into the dean's office and they were saying that this is unprofessional. It doesn't agree with the code of um, uniform policy and I have to remove it. So I had to explain to this old white man again that, oh, this is part of my cultural heritage. It's how I express my ethnicity and my culture. And I think I was 26 years old at this point in time. And this man told me I needed a letter from my parents to justify me being able to wear this piercing saying it's part of my cultural heritage. And I was just like, I understand that you're in a position of authority and you're trying to dominate me and can ask me to conform to what your version of professionalism is, but you cannot dictate how I express my culture. And I was like, I will continue to wear this and you can't stop me from doing it. And I was going to escalate it to the student union, but he decided to drop it. But again, I think living in Toronto before I moved there, I had this false sense of um, security that everyone understands, you know, cultural boundaries, you're free to express how you feel and you're able to dress freely and, and do whatever you want because that's how I felt when I was here. But there it was very different. You were expected to conform to their definition of what professional attire is. I, it's definitely been different since I've moved back, but um, cultural ignorance, racism is very overt in the US, comparatively speaking. As dental health professionals here in Canada, in Toronto, one of the most diverse cities probably in North America, do you ever feel that you encounter any challenges because of race in your professional day-to-day -day life with patients or colleagues within the industry? Or was that more so in the States? Uh, Gigi, let's start so, with you. Again, um, I, I did encounter it more overtly in the US. In Toronto, I have to say, so I practiced for a short period of time with Dr. Banerjee in the downtown core, but so I, I practiced for three years in downtown Toronto. Um, and then I practiced on the reserves in Northern Ontario for a year. And then for the last six years, I've been practicing at a family practice in Mississauga. I have never felt that there was any negative impact of me being a visible minority 
as long as I've been practicing in Toronto. In fact, I felt that it was the opposite because I'm not, there's such a huge South Asian population that exists here, especially in the practice where I work now, that I'm able to borrow from my cultural experiences. I'm able to use my native tongue to communicate with my patients. Um, my, I, have, I have an extra layer of understanding of certain hesitancies that exist, certain cultural practices that may impact oral healthcare that I can use to be a better healthcare provider for my patients. So it's actually been a distinct advantage. And as the, the composition of society in Canada and especially in Toronto changes, something that was looked at negatively has now become a, a strength. I remember when I first moved back here, I started applying for jobs in dentistry and I was only getting callbacks from Mississauga Brampton. And I had several friends born and raised in Toronto suggested to me that I change my name on my resume. And the only reason I was getting callbacks from Brampton, Mississauga is because people in downtown don't want to hire someone that has an ethnic sounding name, quote unquote, or like they don't want to hire um, immigrant dentists. And I was, again, flabbergasted at this being a thing. And then I quickly learned that this was a common practice here. And other people with my background had encountered these barriers and had to adjust and accommodate to make other people feel more comfortable. And that was probably the only time that I felt that I needed to compensate for my, my ethnicity and my culture. Other than that, my experience as a visible minority has been quite positive. Mind you, it's also because of the profession that I'm in. It, it confers on you a certain status a certain credibility, like when you have the name doctor, dentist, you're automatically um, given a certain amount of class status where things that may be barriers for other women who look like I do are no longer barriers for me because I am now part of the, the elite professions, right? It's great to hear that you've had a positive experience. And I mean, we can face it, but where we happen to live is very diverse. Uh, the title doesn't hurt. I'm sure that you've established your own credibility with time, being the consummate professional that you clearly are. I can tell you the finance industry where I am is no different. 20 plus years ago, I was also advised to change my name on my resume, which I never did. And I'm happy to say that 20 years later, no one cares. It's beautiful. <laughs> Um, at least in my world, it's it's very different. It's very evolved. And I grew up in Texas, a land where color at that time didn't exist. So I can share some of your uh, Ohio experiences. I was asked because I moved from Toronto if I lived in an igloo because I was from Canada. And uh, I, I can go on for days, but I won't do that. <laughs> my experience was a little different than than. GG's. Um, when I graduated initially, I went to Sunnybrook. Uh, I was still thinking about doing a speci specialty um, in anesthesia. And uh, like Gigi, I went up north to Sioux Lookout. It's the, um, it's Northern Ontario. It's part of the internship. We go out to the reserves and uh, you're providing dental care to, to uh, you know, uh, communities that really, really need help with healthcare. Um, but uh, coming back, coming back to Toronto, um, I was hired by uh, a Jewish dentist uh, owner um, in Brampton. And uh, I'm pretty sure looking back on it now, he hired me because of my name, thinking that perhaps I would speak Punjabi um, because Brampton was very Punjabi, uh, his area that he was in, and it still, still definitely is. Um, and I think he was a little disappointed that, you know, here's this Indian dentist who <laughs> didn't speak the language. I didn't speak Punjabi. And, um, uh, and there was also uh, the male sort of, as Gigi had touched on, he, he wasn't, uh, very mentoring, let's just put it that way. Um, and I left, I left soon after. Um, I ended up in a great associateship, downtown Toronto and, and Gigi was there for a while as well. 
I was mentored by two amazing women, uh, female dentists. I can't thank them enough. Uh, if I'm good at all, it's because of them. They took the time uh, and, and gave me their energy and their expertise and taught me excellent skills um, and, and how, to, how to treat the, the human attached to the mouth, you could say. And, and they were, their backgrounds were very different. One was Asian and uh, the other female was Jewish. Um, and then uh, it's interesting, they sold to a big, they were part of the big partnership uh, corporation called Ultima. Uh, that happened afterwards. Um, but it was always very uh, collaborative uh, and mentoring. I think that's huge. I think that's a huge thing. Uh, for women to do for other women. And I try my best now to be that way as well. Um, in terms of the patient base, uh, my experience I think is sort of like yours, Farhana, uh, because it's corporate, it's the financial core. I'm in First Canadian Place, uh, which is you know right in the middle of the core. Um, very highly educated, uh, patient base, um, diverse ethnicities, um, white, black, Asian, Indian. Um, I think as Gigi said as well, having the, the white lab coat, uh, you're in a position of power, um, authority, if you, if you will. Um, and, you know, you might look young when you're starting, but as time progresses, as your skill set grows, as your confidence grows, uh, you know, they, they trust you, you know, if you will, with the authority of the, the, the lab coat and having um, DR in front of your name. Um, so, you know, uh, my experience, um, I'd like to say is very positive, um, except for, you know, <laughs> hey, we all have moments and they help us grow and they help us shape who we are. And right. it certainly does help to explain a lot about how you, Deb, became part of this femme world where we focus our energy on, you know, women helping women. And maybe that's why I was so attracted to femme as well, because I did have these two amazing female mentors in my life that guided uh, uh, my career path. Well, we're glad to have you as part of our little track. So, you know, obviously we are reaping the benefits of your positive experience. So thanks for being here. I am too. Of us. Deb has always been a mentor to me. I've learned so much from you the years we work together and I continue to get advice from you whenever I can. See, that's what it's all about, ladies. That's what it's all about. We take care of each other. We pay it forward. All right, let's talk a little bit about your predictive skills. Let's talk a little bit about how you think the dental profession, maybe even we can expand that into the medical world, has changed, whether it's permanently or for at least the foreseeable future because of this pandemic. I would love to hear some of your thoughts on how, how your profession has had to pivot and evolve because of lockdown, safety, this crazy, crazy COVID-19 that no one saw coming, but also what you think the future of dentistry and medical healthcare is gonna look like going forward based on what you've seen since your practices have opened back up again, some insights on where you think the future is headed, especially for your profession. Dr. Gigi, let's start with you. Okay. so. We're going on almost a year since our practices reopened. So in case everyone's not aware, um, in March, 2020, all dental offices were closed for just over a three month period of time, um, emergent care only, which most couldn't provide because we didn't have access to the appropriate PPE, which included N95 respirators. They were all being reserved for frontline staff, understandably at hospitals. Um, so before I go into how this will change our profession going forward, I wanna to speak to what that three month pause meant to us as professionals. And I've spoken to a lot of my colleagues and a lot of them felt this way. 
you start to, um, you've been practicing for 10 years, you start to take your profession for granted sometimes, you know, you assume you're going to wake up the next day, you're going to go in, be able to do what you do daily. So when we, when that was taken away for that three month period of time, I think a lot of us had a lot of time to think about what our profession means to us and how important it is to our daily lives. And um, it reinforced our love for what we do. So when we did come back, it was with a renewed sense of purpose and we're driven to uh, continue to provide the best care possible, but it had a, a, a new um, shine to it. So that aside, Obviously, there's been some major changes in terms of the way a lot of healthcare is being conducted both in our homes and in, in, in the offices. But you also have to remember dentistry is a profession where we've always dealt with infectious diseases. We work in patients' mouths. We work with blood and saliva. So our infection control protocols have always been extremely stringent. Um, but the challenge we were dealing with now was an airborne pathogen, which is widely spread out in the community and not always detectable. So there were structural changes that had to be made to our practices. There were changes that had to be made in terms of our PPE in order to protect ourselves, our staff, our patients. And then there were certain changes that had to be made in terms of protocol, like you could no longer have a number of patients hanging out in your waiting area, chatting with them about you know ongoing daily lives, et cetera. So those things had to change. and those changes were implemented extremely quickly. I would say within two weeks of the mandates being put out, most offices had made those changes, um, made those changes and gone above and beyond what our, our colleges were asking us in order to make our practices the most safe possible for our patients and our staff. Now, in terms of what this means for the future moving forward, when it comes to infection control protocols, it is very difficult to roll them back because how do you justify um, not wearing gowns, not wearing masks? How do you justify not having the air purifiers in your offices when you know that makes your patients safer? So a lot of the infection control changes that were made, I suspect are going to be permanent. Moving forward, our patients were already safe, but now they're going to be even safer. Our staff are going to be even safer. We're much more aware of um, infectious diseases and pathogens even more than they were before. But the other factor was the generalized fear that exists in our community about, can I go to the dental office? Should I go in for elective treatment? And should I only go in if it's an emergency? What is the probability of me catching the virus while I'm there? And that's been the true challenge. I mean, Deb and I speak about this all the time. It's been Dentistry is already a physically exhausting profession, but it has been even more so emotionally exhausting because anytime a patient is walking in the door, they're already apprehensive. No one loves to go to the dentist and get a filling or a tooth pulled or a root canal. That's not a pleasant experience as much as we try to make it the best we can. So you're already dealing with people that are apprehensive walking in the door. And now you combine that with the possibility of contracting the deadly virus. So you have to spend a lot of time dealing with anxiety, dealing with apprehension. You have to spend even more time doing patient education, you know, helping your staff feel safe. So it's emotionally, mentally, physically draining. Deb, was there anything you wanted to add to this? I think Dr. Gigi summed it up quite lovely in a quite a lovely manner, but I'd love to hear some of your thoughts as well. This isn't going away. Like COVID is not going away and there are new variants and there will be new viruses. As Gigi mentioned, we've always been as a industry, as a field of healthcare, we've always been above board with IPAC and infe infection control. We've had to be. We deal with one of the dirtiest, <laughs> excuse my language, places in the body every day, every second, um, so you will have seen that there's been, I haven't heard of any transmissibility with cases within our field, at least in Toronto, um, because we are above board um, and we'll continue to adapt and pivot. As Gigi said, we, 
were very quick as a whole industry. Within two weeks, we, we sourced out PPE. We figured out how to manage this, this pandemic and this problem, um, structural changes and, and really the, it was the PPE. And, and limiting, limiting contact, limiting patients. Um, the one thing I will say, I, you know, we've always sort of kept work at work, but now, you know, with gowns, with scrubs, nothing comes home, you know. For a while I was, you know, taking everything off in the garage and not coming in, you know, you're, you're worried, I have children. Um, my, my, uh, their father, my ex-husband also is in healthcare we, it, it, it touched on so many different aspects of our lives, even personally. Um, my children's schedule changed. I'm going into work and as Gigi said, uh, the first, first few months, March till June, when we were still figuring out this pandemic and how contagious is this virus? Um, surface contact, is it living on surfaces? So, uh, you know, uh, my ex-husband and I, we were figuring out where do we keep the children? Who's going into work? Who's doing emergency care? He's, he's hospital-based, I'm clinical-based. So it touched on every aspect of our lives. So um, nothing's gonna change going forward. If anything, we will keep adapting, keep pivoting and, uh, keeping everyone healthy and safe. Well, I know hearing from both of you has definitely helped me feel more comfortable about the future of my medical care, my dental care. You're right, you can't go backwards. Once you've enhanced your protocols to such a level that you've given this incredible comfort to your patients, you can't possibly go backwards. So I'm, I'm grateful to hear it personally. I mean, mom of two kids, I, I don't want to be any place where we're bringing home any germs other than the ones that are absolutely necessary. Deb, you just touched on a really interesting point. You brought up the changes that you and your children's dad had to make because of the pandemic, because you're both in the healthcare profession, and you have two young sons that you obviously want to make sure are safe and protected. I'm sure that there are probably a lot of other ways that this pandemic has affected your life, both of you, both of your lives, professionally and personally, and juggling and being able to have all these balls in the air is a big challenge I think all women overcome um, and have to deal with, especially in light of the last 14 months of our lives being completely tossed on our heads. Um, Deb, as a mom, as a single mom and a medical healthcare professional, how have you been juggling all of your responsibilities? Well, <laughs> it hasn't been easy, but uh, you know, it just shows you how adaptable human beings are. Um, as I was mentioning, um, their father and I were both in healthcare. Uh, he wasn't going into the hospitals as much as I was doing emergent care. And it was really in the beginning, it was the fear of the unknown. We didn't know how contagious this virus was. Uh, I didn't even want to go in March, April, May. As Gigi knows, you know, as dentists, we have to deal with emergencies all the time. And you can't do things virtually, <laughs> not with what we do. So we would go in you know, scheduling patients, um, uh, something new in our industry is called fallow time, right? Letting the air uh, be clean, cleaned out, uh, surgical clean scrubbers, HEPA filters, all of that stuff. Um, uh, we already touched on PPE, et cetera. Um, coming home, I would make sure that nothing I wore or had with me at the office or the clinic would come into uh, the house. Um, my children weren't going to school. I mean, when did that happen? That's never happened. They're, you know, it's formative years. They're not young, that young anymore. Grade seven, grade 11, 12. Uh, what's happening with their schools? What's happening with their education? Um, we're lucky enough, we've got a roof over our heads 
and they they went to they go to some some good schools so they were able to manage with technology um but scheduling their home i'm home how you know who's where who who's on what computer who's uh, online uh, you know all of that stuff which which all parents have had to deal with um last thing i will say professionally me not working when when has that ever happened i i've i feel like i've been working since i was 14 um and in dentistry uh since i was 18 um not having an income a steady income uh for three and a half months um and i've realized uh, Gigi mentioned this uh, we love doing what we do uh, I get a lot of self-worth validation from, as corny as it sounds, taking care of patients, taking care of people. I wasn't doing that for the first time in decades. Uh, so it, it, it was a very challenging, difficult time. But we, we were, I want to say that the, you know, light is at the end of the tunnel. We, we've really come out. Uh, I'm, I'm proud of all of us. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. You know, it has been difficult for moms, for professionals, for people just dealing with the gap in income that I know that you had to deal with initially. Dr. Gigi, how was juggling the pandemic and your personal and professional life for you? How has this changed the way that you live day to day? One of the major things that I realized was that I do take on the role of the the person that takes care of, of my family's health and by my family I mean my partner my parents and my my partner's parents um it was interesting when it came down to you know making sure everybody had masks making sure everybody had PPE handy everyone was aware of the new protocols and then even down to booking everyone's vaccine appointments like uh, even though I was working six days a week I ended up doing all of those things and Initially, I thought that's just, oh, that's because that's my personality. I'm just the person that, you know, gets stuff done. But when my partner went to get his vaccination, he was speaking to the physician that was delivering it. And the physician was like, so who booked your appointment? And he's like, oh, my wife made it for me. And the physician said, that's really interesting. 85% of the people that have come in here for their vaccines, their appointments were made by their wives. So I think a lot of times, even though we're in this world where traditional gender normative rules are changing and you know women are, are you know we're working we're primary breadwinners etc there are certain things where as much as things change they remain the same where not only were we taking on the responsibility of taking on care of our patients making sure our staff is fine there was also this additional burden of making sure everyone at home is okay making sure that um, you know, all of the new things that they need to take care of are taken care of, especially when it comes to their health. I think De Deb summed it up really beautifully in one of her comments. She said, this isn't going away. And that's exactly it. This isn't going away. All we have is the way that we choose to handle it. And coming together has, I think, been probably our biggest strength. We have all found ways to help each other, whether it's through friendships, through Zoom calls, through checking in, the odd text message, whatever it takes to help each other know that we're not alone. And I mean that as a community, globally, people are taking care of each other in ways that they probably never did before. They're taking the time to think about one another's well-being simply because we're all in this together. Our boats might look different, but we're all in the same storm. Ladies, thank you both so much for your time, for your energy, for your candor, for sharing your incredible experiences with us and giving us some insights into the future of the medical profession. I think it gives us a lot of comfort to hear from both of you, to know how safe all of you are keeping all of us. On behalf of everyone at FEM TV, thank you so much. Viewers, please join us for our next episode. And until then, take good care.